This morning, we're going to be talking about holiness, which admittedly is not a popular topic at this time, in this age. A lot of times we, we think about, uh, people, people think about Christianity, they, they, they think about uh, the Christian faith or even just religion in general as, as a checklist, an impossible checklist of to do and to don't. Things to do and things to stay away from. And they think of this impossible, this impossible list that can't be possibly kept. The, uh, the don't drink, dance, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. And many of us heard that phrase growing up. Or if you didn't hear that phrase, then you've heard a newer version of that phrase. Or you've had that perception painted of, for you that there's this, that, that the Christian faith is just this, this impossible checklist that you could never live up to. And that, that concept pervades our, our culture. And it's how people look at and think about Christians. But that's not what we see in Scripture. That's not how uh, Christianity is defined. That's not uh, exactly how what holiness looks like. As we look this morning at holiness, uh, living out of faith beyond words. Um, so I want to begin this morning with the definition of what is holiness. And, and so holiness is, it is purity it is a moral, uh, moral purity. It is freedom, not freedom to sin, freedom from sin. It's freedom from the, uh, the slavery to sin that we once had before Christ in our lives. It is living in accordance with God's character, with his nature, with all the things that we've been talking about in this sermon series of who is God. He is the very definition of of good, the very definition of perfection. So it is living out in, in consistency with that, living that out in our lives, a faith that goes beyond mere words and actually impacts our lives. So that's what, what holiness is, but I also want to take a moment to say, you know, what is holiness not? And it, we're not talking about, and please hear this, and we've already mentioned this in our series already, but faith, but holiness is not salvation based on works. It's not being good enough to earn God's grace. It's not being so, uh, so disciplined that we are good enough, that God has no choice but to just, you know, that we're saved because we're better than others. But it is, it's not that we can deserve it but rather that God's grace is a free gift. It's a free gift that he has paid on the cross and extended to us that we are free to accept or to reject. So when we're talking about holiness and living out our faith in a way that reflects God's nature, we're not talking about earning your salvation. Peter, the Apostle Peter, in his first letter, in the first chapter, starting in verse 14, I want to read what he has to say about living a holy life. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he has called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. So here Peter quotes from the Old Testament. He quotes from Leviticus 19 and elsewhere we see in the Old Testament where God reveals himself to his people Israel and says, I am holy. There is none like me. I am set apart. I am separate. There is none like me. I am perfect and pure and holy, spotless, without error, without fault, without sin. And, and, and so God reveals himself to his people that way. And God doesn't stop there. He actually goes on to say, and be holy as I am holy. And he calls his people to actually live lives 
that are set apart, that are distinct from the culture and the society around them. He calls them to live out, not reflecting the culture, but live out reflecting who he is. Be holy, for I am holy. And God sets out these distinctions to be made between that is what is clean and that which is unclean. And God is so careful and cares so much about keeping his people pure and holy and set apart, not to set up this impossible checklist, but in order that they can actually be a light to the nations around them. See, God hasn't just called his people to some, uh, to some special knowledge, to just know something or believe something, but he's called them to actually live a new life. He's called them to actually put it into practice. It's not about just correcting your theology in terms of your thinking and knowing what the truth is, but he calls his people Israel to be distinct in their lifestyle in what they do, in who they are reflecting, in their choices, in their lives. The gospel message is not merely a set of philosophical ideas to be understood or to be spoken, but it is rather for us to live out in our daily lives faithfully, to live a totally new, transformed life. Peter then says in chapter 2, verse 9 of the same letter, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so Peter calls this, the early church and says, you are chosen, you are. God called you out, not just so you would be saved, not just so you would get into heaven, not just so you would know the truth, but he called you out to be his royal priesthood, to be a holy nation to be set apart and to actually reflect his character, to actually reflect his holiness, not just in words, not in empty words, but in action, in lifestyle. He calls us to live a life that shouts, that shouts the gospel, the truth of the gospel message. It's not enough to come here and sing praises on Sunday mornings and then go home and live lives that, that reflect the culture and not the gospel truth. It's not enough to just give God one hour a week and to put on your Christian hat and say, okay, I, I, I played church, so I'm good for the week. That God has not called us to that. He has called us to actually live out lives that reflect his light into the darkness around us. That he's called us to be a holy nation, a chosen people. Not based, a nation that's not based on race, it's not based on, on what we look like or where we come from, but to be a, his holy nation who faithfully pursues living lives that please him and that reflect him to people who are in desperate need of the light that we have within us as Christ's followers. Continuing on, dear friends, as I urge, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So he's called us to live lives that other people will look at and recognize and see something different 
in the way that we live, to see the hope that is in us, and see that we're not just a group of people, a social club that have decided to play church on Sundays, but that we are radically changed, transformed people who not only speak the gospel, but live it out in our lives. That God has called us to not just know the truth, but to live his truth. He offers us more than true statements. He offers us more than merely good ideas, more than just offering who who he is. He offers us a, a completely new, a radically new and changed life, no longer conforming to our sinful ways that we used to live, that we used to pursue, that we were slaves to but that we have been freed from that and called to live lives that reflect, that reflect the king. The gospel message, and the gospel message that, uh, that we proclaim with our lips. See, we are citizens of heaven living under the rule Uh, living under the rule and under the grace of the pure and holy king of kings. That Peter says that we are to live here on this earth as strangers, as foreigners. Not to get too comfortable, but that we are here for a limited time. And that while here, we are to reflect him and to live lives that point others to the truth. As we've talked about, God could have just once we accept him and once we accept the truth, then he could transport us into heaven. But that's not how it works. We're still here amidst this broken world. Not because God can't do it without us, but because he has called us to be his people. He has called us. If you remember God's call to Abram, when he promises him that he will be a father of many nations and he will bless him and his descendants after him. He doesn't just say, okay, Abram, I'm going to bless you and your children for their sake because I like, I like you guys. No, he blesses Israel in order that they can be a blessing to all nations. He says that through you, all nations will be blessed. He doesn't call out this this one nation and say, okay, I just prefer you guys. I like you guys. No, he calls them to be his hands and feet, to shine his light to all the nations around them. The prophet Ezekiel. Actually, before I I get to Ezekiel, I want to pause for a moment and say, you know, when we're talking about living lives that reflect Jesus, that reflect the truth and the gospel that we speak, that we, that we teach, that we say with our lips. The weight that our lives carry in the, the lives of the people around us. I know Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like their Christ, but I don't like his Christians. Because you Christians are so unlike the Christ that you profess. And, you know, in a, in a, in a funny way, I, I have for years decided not to have Christian bumper stickers on my car because no matter how I drive, if I drive the speed limit, if I go a little bit over the speed limit, under the speed limit, everyone, you know, people are, are you're, you're, you're driving either like a maniac to some or you're driving like a moron to others. And you're either driving too fast or too slow. Or, you know, how many of us have been driving and someone cuts you off and you see the Jesus Saves bumper sticker on their car? And so for me, I, like, I just don't want to, I don't want to do anything to besmirch God's holy name. And to stop and realize that when we put on ourselves, we bear the name Christ by calling ourselves Christians. That what we do, that how we talk how we live, how we act, it matters because it is tied to Jesus' name that we should care about how we are reflecting his name. Are we representing him 
faithfully? Are we representing him well? Or are we causing people to say, see, I knew they were fakes. I knew they were just playing church. I knew they didn't really believe it. They haven't really changed. God has called us to live holy lives because it matters to us, to our relationship with him, because it matters to others around us who may or may not accept the truth of the gospel based on what they see in our lives. So it matters to God. Our sin also matters to God because it is, as we've talked about, it is a relationship with God that he's called us to, not merely a different belief system. He's called us into a loving relationship. And so we'd actually stop and realize, wait a minute, when I, when I disobey God and I sin against him, I break his heart. That I have, I have broken the relationship. The problem isn't that, okay, I broke some rule, some arbitrary rule that God just put out there and knew I couldn't really live up to. But no, I've broken his heart that he created me and he's called me lovingly to be more. And so when I begin to see this as a relationship, not a checklist, I start to see that, wait a minute, I need to actually apologize. I need to come before God and God say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for taking sin lightly. I'm sorry for disobeying you and treating it like it didn't make a difference, like it didn't matter. And the, the in Ezekiel 36, God makes it very clear what he, that he cares about his name and how that reflects on the other, on the nations, on the people around us. God says, I had concern for my holy name, speaking to Israel, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord. When I show myself holy through you before their eyes. And so God tells Israel that they have profaned his name. They have put a mark on his name uh, to the other nations who are watching Israel, who are watching their lifestyle, who are watching what they're doing and how they're living in Israel is mixing God's truth with the ideas and even the worship of the surrounding nations. It's referred to as syncretism, of mixing the holy with the unholy. And, and so you know, God calls them to stop profaning his name and to start living lives that lift up his name, that represent who he is that shine his light into the darkness around. We are called to stand out, to live lives that point to the gospel truth. Continuing on in Ezekiel, for I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you up from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. So that Israel has been dispersed. Israel's been conquered by Babylon. They've been dispersed. And God says, I will bring you back. I will bless you. I will cleanse you. I will make you new. But you are to be holy. Continuing on, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So God promises to remove their hearts of stone and to give them renewed, restored hearts of flesh. And he promises to give them his spirit. See, God doesn't just create this, this, this checklist and say, do this, don't do this, and sit back and say, I knew you couldn't do it. And just sit back and, and judge them. But no, God gives us his spirit to empower us to live lives that reflect him, to abstain from sin, to accurately represent him. Not on our power, not because we're so good, not because we're so strong, but because he is, because he has offered us his strength and his power to live holy, transformed lives. And that is what we're talking about when we're talking about holiness. We're not talking about pulling ourselves up from our bootstraps and, and, and living good, perfect lives because, again, we are so good but it is being so connected to and so reliant on God's spirit to empower us to live lives that reflect him accurately, that shine his light. Continuing on in Ezekiel, he says, you will live in the land I gave your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine on you. So God calls his people, tells them he is holy. He calls them to likewise be holy. He tells, he calls us to stop profaning his name, but to actually receive his spirit, allow him to renew us from the inside out to change our hearts and our lives. And he promises to bless, to bless us when we do that. I wanna, in closing the service, I wanna come back to the verse that we, that Rana opened up with this morning from Romans. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. Paul says to the early church, therefore, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Offer your bodies as pure and holy to God, pleasing unto God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Continuing on, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so the question this morning is, are you living a life that you can place on the altar before God and say, God, this is my gift to you with the limited time, with the limited resources, with the limitations I had here on this earth. This is my offering before you. May be pleasing in your sight. Lord, I want to give back to you what you have given me and blessed me with. You've called me to be a royal priest, to change my life, to be changed from the inside out. And so this morning, regardless of where you've been, regardless of the past where you may have profaned God's name, bearing his name and living lives that sharply contrasted your words. This morning, I urge for each of us to receive God's spirit in our lives and allow him to take out this heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, with his spirit to empower us to live new lives because that is what God has called us to do. And that is essentially what we're talking about when we talk about holiness, is living out our faith, having a faith that isn't made of just empty words, but is a pleasing sacrifice unto God.
Would you bow with me as I pray? Lord, we come before you, and we thank you, Lord, for you. You are holy. You are perfect. You are pure. You are without sin. You are the very definition of that which is good, that, Lord, you have given us the example in, in Jesus, that we actually have Jesus to look to. We have your son to look to, to actually say, this is what holiness looks like, and that you have paid the price for us to actually be your people, to be your children. And that you have called us not just to new belief and then go home and live life as it was, but to live new lives. Lord, we, we lift up to you our lives, our hearts, our minds. Lord, would you search us? Shine your light in every dark corner of our hearts. And Lord, anything that you see that breaks your heart, Lord, that, that would tarnish your name, would you highlight in us and change? Would you inspire us and empower us, Lord, to be able to live lives that are pleasing sacrifice for you? It is in your name that we pray. Amen.